actually quite grateful for the opportunity to talk about archaeology and rising sea levels, uh, both from global perspectives and local concerns. Uh, some of you have heard me speak in, in various venues. Uh, I actually try to mix things up as I do public speaking. Uh, this is very much the, the professor speaking today. I came late to this growing concern about rising sea levels in archaeology. It's been pulsating through the field for several years. And what I want to do with this presentation is actually have you help me go through the journey through some of the academic work that's going on. Uh, this is not original research. This is kind of the framing. This is in the sense of those academics in the room. Here's my literature review as I try to figure out what we can do here at Sarasota Manatee. I'll start, hopefully with some humor. Uh, <laughs> in case you're confused who I am, I'm not Al Gore. And I mentioned that uh, because back in the 1990s, uh, as you all are aware, Al Gore spent a lot of effort warning Americans that climate was changing, that this was a crisis that was coming upon us, and we better start doing something. Uh, he did a book. He was involved politically in the uh, protocol dealing with carbon levels. He's kind of famous for the slideshow he put together that was kind of uh, gloom and doom. A uh, film was made. And in fact, this has been a theme of the last decade. Uh, I have some National Geographic covers as well. That, oh my goodness, something is coming. Well, uh, I'm not Al Gore. It, it, I don't want to talk about what's coming because that time has passed. We're in a new age. We're in an age of dealing with uh, climate change, with rising sea levels, and we need to know what to do. And the theme that's been uh, pulsating is community resilience for this time period. What can we do as the larger and more ferocious hurricanes come our way? What can we do as the climate's changing, as the water levels are rising? What can we do to take care of our communities? And I'm not asking that just generally. My training, my teaching, my scholarship comes from archaeology. And so I want to work through with you some of the lessons that are coming from archaeology. As Shay mentioned, uh, part of uh, being engaged with this issue comes from being invited by the Florida Public Archaeology Network to help co-host uh, Titally United. I still find that title a little humorous. Uh, it's now the third annual Tyler United is coming in August. At the end of the presentation, I'll say a little more about it. It started in St. Augustine, looking at engagement with public officials. Last summer, it was working with the Seminole Tribe of Florida. Uh, for Sarasota, we want to engage the public to a greater extent than those previous attempts have been. And I want to make sure that the public actually understands, as speaking as an academic, what's going on. And I enjoy making simple points. I think fundamentally, if we're going to approach how to act effectively in this new age, how we can get lessons from archaeology, we actually know what we are speaking about. And we start with a conundrum that we hear that term over and over again, rising sea levels, and you know the sea isn't level. Right? The Earth is round. <laughs> Seas can't be level. And I raise that because it is self-evident, but also quite confusing. We're dealing with uneven rises in the sea level, and we have to start with that knowledge that we're not looking at something that's consistent, even across the, the coast of Florida, and clearly not across the world. Uh, we have to always keep in mind the difference, and this is part of the political debates that go on that are stopping us from learning the important lessons, between weather, the variables for short periods of time, versus the climate the cognitive picture of weather over the long period of time. We're going to have weather events. Sometimes we'll have cool spells and hot spells, rainy seasons and droughts. That will oscillate. But what we seem to be having at this point is the climate itself has changed. The pattern has changed. And we have to have that sense that even if we have a bit of a change in the short term. We're looking at, and this is where archaeology comes in really handy, uh, the long-term dynamics. The third term, right, rising sea levels, seas aren't level, 
uh, climate and weather. The third is this wonderfully new term that comes out in geology. We are, I like this little diagram, we're in a new geological age. One of the things archaeologists do is excavate. Some of you help me on these <coughs> excavations. And it's easy enough to kind of excuse what we're seeing in excavation units, but it's pretty consistent. And when you have something that's consistent, not just locally, not just regionally, not just uh, continental-wide, but around the world, uh, something's going on. And you can barely see any of these words because the slide is just too dark, sorry to say. But we have two dynamics which are clear around the world. One, wherever any archaeologist is excavating, anywhere, you're going to find plastics, fibers, uh, microplastics, uh, the estimate is 9 billion tons that are around the world and it's found everywhere and what you can't see here because of the darkness of the slide is since the nuclear testing that occurred in the mid 20th century the evidence from the radiation is global for archaeologists who use carbon radio, radiocarbon dating it's part of the calculations they have to go in it's just a uniform fact around the world and this way this geological period of time is not uh, as it was for our earliest ancestors during the Pleistocene, during the Ice Age. It's not the Holocene, the last oh, about 10,000 years that humans have been around the planet. It's, and there's of course wonderful debates on it, the last 50 years or so that humans have fundamentally changed this planet and that we can see it in a geological manner in some ways, the bigger project is for us to really grapple and understand this entirely new geological period. There's a, a secondary concern about climate change and the tertiary on rising sea levels. I'm just going to deal with that tertiary uh, aspect, the rising sea levels. And even as we go around town, we see it wherever we go. We try to go by the Tamiami Trail and Wrangling Causeway, you find this sign and if you're lucky, that's all you notice is a sign, because as the tides are getting higher, that roadway floods, and seemingly any small amount of rain now floods the Tamiami Trail, the main road going by the coast. You can see it often. Last fall, I had a real uh, wonderful opportunity to take a group of new college students to see their archaeological historic sites around Man uh, Manatee and Sarasota counties. We started in August and went through August, September, uh, October, November. Uh, in September, I took them down to historic Spanish Point. Uh, they got to see the windows to the past that time sifters have created decades ago. They got to see the historic homes. And then for about five minutes it rained and all the pathways flooded because the water level has just risen to that extent. Uh, luckily, these were new college students who don't believe in wearing shoes anyway, so <laughs> they didn't mind trudging through the, the wet uh, pathways. Up in DeSoto National Memorial, another place that Time Sifters has uh, made important contributions, especially Sheriff Speckus. There's a, a you, this is from uh, May of 2016, I haven't had a chance to go into a recent photo. Uh, the USGS marker is now in the water. The uh, uh, DeSoto Point is now considerably smaller than it had been a couple of decades ago. You can see it sitting right there. Where, uh, something has clearly changed. It's not just in Florida. We see the implications of this around the world, the extent of this crisis that's facing people in Alaska. A village had to move, a Native American village, because the sea levels had risen. It's the same story in Louisiana, where the Delta is disappearing, and a Native American community has been forced to relocate <coughs> from their homeland. Uh, as the webpage shows, they seem to have a good attitude about it. Uh, but lives are changing. Decisions are being made about how to reorganize oneself. And it's happening, not about to happen. 
not predicted to happen, but occurring as we speak now. Archaeologists have been noticing this as well. Uh, my colleague, I always like having some photos of some of my colleagues up, uh, Elizabeth Chilton, when she was at Harvard, was excavating on uh, Cape Cod, because a uh, site, you can see it quite clearly here, was being eroded away and before the graves fell into the sea. She and her students were excavating them out to protect them. In Maine, one of the largest middens is being washed away. And again, closer to home, in what is a very sad story in so many ways, Egmont Key in the mouth of Tampa Bay is eroding away. And it's not just a beautiful little island. This was a place for the Seminole tribe of Florida uh, that is really at the center of their history. During the Trail of Tears, during the Third Seminole War, when so many of the Seminoles were forced to leave Florida, one of the places they were taken was at Monkey. Hundreds died while waiting to be transported to Indian Territory, to Oklahoma, and were buried on this key, and now it's being eroded away. The photos from the Tribal Historic Preservation Office show what used to be the island and what's only there now, with real concerns about what to do about this place, how to preserve it, what to preserve, what to remember of a part of the history that really is important to all the descendants still living in Florida, as well as those living in Oklahoma. Uh, Margot Schwadron has been by Sarasota a number of times, working with the National Park Service. Uh, she points to Fort Jefferson, surrounded by water, off one of their remote keys. It does not look in good shape. And again, becomes kind of this is going to be a theme as I move through this. And there's a recursive aspect to it. One, we see across all these sites the implications of the rising sea levels. And we see at these sites the questions of what to do, what do they tell us about our future, and what can we do about them. A recent uh, study got a lot of good attention. Again, apologies, this is not uh, visible with the slide. You see in the image, looking at the projections using geographic information uh, systems, GIS, uh, Dave Aniston and his colleagues were able to work through what would be the sites, archaeological resource sites lost if this one meter of sea level rise. And their estimate, based on the recorded sites, right, the sites that we know about, is over 13,000 sites will be lost. Over 1,000 locations that are eligible for National Register of Historic Places. If it's a two meter rise, it's over 32,000. But then they know that's just what's lost on the coast. Of course, there are people living on the coast. There's more people living on the coast now than ever in human history. As the sea levels rise and they move away, they're going to be displaced, and as they move to other places, they'll be disturbing, changing the archaeological record. It's a crisis. It's a crisis for management. It's a crisis uh, for figuring out what we can do. Are we going to lose our past as these sea levels rise? Well, I'm not here just to be depressing about it. <laughs> right? That there's two dynamics that are coming to the fore. And I think they are interrelated. And I want to kind of I'm going to stress the second one over the first one. But I think they're both quite important. One, and this is the management issue that archaeologists are concerned about protecting archaeological sites from rising sea levels and storm surge. And second is studying the ancients for what we can learn, what insights into climate change resilience. Right, the first one, the one I'll do fairly quickly, is taking a lot of time for professionals. Right. Archaeologists, and this is part of the ethics for this organization, for Time Sleep, which is part of Florida Anthropological Society, is we want to protect archaeological sites. This old poster says it quite well. 
people should not just be removing sites, they shouldn't just be bulldozed, they shouldn't just be uh, left to the elements. We should record and know what's there. It's probably just the ethics of being engaged with archaeology and frankly being good citizens and good stewards of the past. The rising sea levels is being approached first, and really excited, an exciting one by Scotland of all places. And I was surprised by this when I first heard it, but it actually makes perfect sense. Scotland, with its uh, large coastline, with the Gulf Stream going up through the Atlantic, has been losing a lot of its archaeological sites, historic sites. And the answer they provided was not to throw up their hands, of course, uh, but to actually ask people to take parts. And this is really, I think, one of the most exciting parts of what's going on with archaeologists today. Uh, I've spent a lot of time, you all have been so supportive of public archaeology, right? doing things with the public, getting involved, giving talks, getting people involved in excavations. Well, this is more citizen science, and goes really logically to it. Uh, there aren't enough archaeologists in Scotland to monitor all the sites. So they've asked the citizens, the residents of Scotland, to help. And they've done it by giving training, by providing a cell phone at available forms, and asking people just to walk around the coastline and note the condition of sites, note the ones that are danger, note the conditions, so they have vast databases being created. And Florida's come <coughs> the same form that here, the Florida Public Archaeology Network has created a Heritage Monitoring Scout Program, and in a similar way, uh, most successfully it looks like around St. Augustine in Pensacola, but we've had some people doing this work here in Sarasota and Manatee, to ask our residents, to ask you all, to go out and about, to look at the archaeological sites, to document what's going on, to tell the professionals, organized by the Florida Public Archaeology Network, what's happening. Uh, as soon as this project started, uh, Hurricane Matthew hit the East Coast and it immediately became a very useful and helpful tool just to know the extent of the damage at historic sites, archaeological sites. So there are things happening. There are people working to try to protect these places. But I want to really talk about I think is the part that uh, ultimately is uh, my passion for archaeology, is what we can learn from the study of the past. There's a tremendous amount of information and concern. Archaeologists have always been interested in the environment, have always looked at how humans have adapted, maladapted, uh, responded to uh, climate change. Right? The very basis of our species seems to be connected and correlates to the change from the Pleistocene to the Holocene. As the Ice Age ended, people started settling down, they started seeing villages, various places around the world, and ultimately the villages seem to connect to become cities, and the way of life that we have starts developing. We know that our very way of life is connected to the global environment, and archaeologists have spent tremendous effort laying that out. We see that with examples again and again. How do the peoples get to the North America? One of the key aspects, of course, uh, Grigia, the land bridge connecting uh, the old world and the new world, Russia and Alaska. As the Ice Age ebbed and flowed, people could move across that area, or they moved across the coast. We see in studies by archaeologists all over the world what happens when these climate change. Uh, this one is just to uh, uh, intrigue you a little bit. Uh, from Tel Dan in the northern part of the state of Israel, the excavations there that have gone on since the last century have been reformulated to look at how much of the changes, the historic changes, connect to climate change? And the uh, very good work that's done by David Long and his colleagues show three periods of enduring droughts that hit uh, the area, and that those droughts, those climate changes, disrupted social and political structures, 
caused water management systems collapse and facilitate marshland expansion. Uh, people moved away and started living lives in different ways because of the lack of the water that prevented the lack of growing enough food to sustain that urban way of life. That micro level, that uh, city version of what's going on had much larger scale implications. Eric Klein produced a book. This is really what the academic writing is. I'm just giving you my citations one after the other. Uh, Eric Klein produced a book, say, 1177 BC, The Year Civilization Collapsed. Those same phenomenons seen at the particular sites seems to have led to mass movement of people and led to the end of the late Bronze Age civilizations and the rise of new polities. These climate changes uh, have large scale repercussions. We know that, but we need to be prepared for them and not just assume that humans will be able to adapt. One of the key studies that lay this out comes from Tom McGovern, who has spent a great deal of effort, a great deal of time looking at the Norse up in Greenland. Up in Greenland, uh, his first few studies laid out what was a logical conclusion at the time. And he, you know, this is from the Smithsonian Magazine, I sometimes like when people put things bluntly. Uh, quote, dumb Norsemen go into the north outside the range of the economy, <coughs> mess up the environment, and then they all die when it gets cold. Right? It's a very simple reductionist view that those people coming up there to Greenland just were not making the right decisions. We have really good archaeological evidence from Tom McGovern's work that as the people were uh, starving, they were building more and more churches. And this is often used as an example of uh, maladaptation, making the wrong choices. But well, McGovern has gone back, looked at his work again, and as any good scholar should do, any good scientist should do, really rethink what might have been going on, and actually has changed the view. He actually has looked more closely, and the Norse were actually making the right choices. It wasn't that they were dumb at any level or maladaptive. There wasn't enough that they could do to sustain their way of life in the Greenland colonies that the changes were much larger scale. He explains how the Black Death affected the trade of ivory objects from Greenland to Europe, and that climate change, plus what he refers to, maybe ironically, as globalization, plus that pandemic, that's what led to the collapse of those Greenland uh, colonies. They were making the right choices. They were doing what they could. It just didn't work at all. There are times that humans cannot overcome what's going on. One of it's a piece of evidence. There was no drama to this. People tidied up when they left. They just gave up living in this place. Uh, that was part of a larger set of uh, dynamics. They actually help us understand what, how the world changed as Europeans spun out across the globe in the 14, 1500s, they were facing a world with a low ice age. And it seems that particularly in the Americas, that change, the cold periods that the pilgrims write about, negatively affected Native American life and allowed or facilitated the European conquest of much of the Americas. Uh, the Europeans came, it seems, it seems at the right time and got to the right place. As we think about that broad, large scale uh, set of changes, uh, I turn again, I'm relying on previous scholars for some of these issues. Uh, I'm looking at the work of Ken Sassman, who's at the University of Florida, and Sassman lays out that we look at the archaeological record, we look at these examples in order to look at and see clearly the paleo environmental changes the ways that people's activities, not just direct people activity, but indirect as well, affect those changes and how people respond to those changes. But we're not just interested in what was happening, but also those perceptions of change. Reading the archaeological record, uh, the settlement patterns, the architecture, the artifacts, the artwork, to see how people are making sense of what was going on around them 
and how those perceptions were affecting their choices, their actions. And thirdly, thinking really hard about in a time when the shorelines are changing, when the climate is uh, being acting in a way that you don't have experience for, how do people make place in terms of communities, and how do they use those places for a resilient to sustain the way of life they wanted to have? It turns out archaeology can actually contribute tremendously to that, and one of the best places to look at that turns out to be Florida. I've done a lot of work here, and so what I want to give is a sense of how across a lot of sites in the state we see some of the answers for how archaeology can inform us in a time of climate change. And I also like just noting that I teach at New College, and I have my office, in the last 20 years I've had my office in what was the Charles and Edith Ringling Mansion, it's now known as College Hall, and I have the great joy, and it is just a great joy, of being able to look out the window and see Sarasota Bay. That's the view I get every time I go to my office. And in many ways, it looks like the same day that I saw 20 years ago. But in fact, it's changed in those years, and it's changed even more greatly in the previous centuries. And I want to give a sense of this. Some of you know Florida archaeology really well, so you make your own contributions. But I want to kind of give that big overview, particularly on this theme of climate change, rising sea levels, and what we see in the archaeological record. So the next part of this presentation is the, the chronology that set of issues. And so just so you have the dates uh, visible for a few moments, uh, we're looking at a really wide expense of time. So I mean, more than 12,000 years ago, the evidence that we have for the Paleo-Indian period at the Warm Mineral Springs, Little Salt Spring, uh, Page, Lands and Sight, the changes that occurred as the ice melted and the sea level rose, the ways of life about 9,500 years ago from the early archaic, the different changes during the middle and late archaic, particularly 5,000 years ago, with uh, shell middens marking the coast and river, the rise of pottery, the mound building phenomenons, and then the rise of complex society. And then 500 years ago, the Spanish started arriving and changing this way of life tremendously. So it's a lot of years. I'm less interested in giving you the uh, chronology as some of the patterns we see as I quickly go through this phenomenon of life in uh, coastal Florida. We'll start with what I think is confusing. And I think it's worthwhile actually understanding this because I've given a couple of talks where I've shown uh, similar slides as this. And it gets misread. During the last ice age, much of the water of the world was tied up in the ice and glaciers. And so Florida itself was much larger. You see here, this was so we're just about right here now. And so it's dozens and dozens of miles uh, inland from what was the much bigger peninsula. As the ice melted, the water level rose, the particularities of this uh, shelf meant it rose up to get to this point here. Uh, this is to tell us that humans have dealt with climate change and rising sea levels before. This was not a human phenomenon. This was just a cycle of our planet going around the sun, making slow changes. And it is helpful to have a sense that this is what people start settling this land. We refer to this as the Clovis period uh, in terms of the circles you see there. And of course, most of the archaeological sites were found on land. It turns out, and this is where some of the underwater work is just so exciting, uh, it's been bubbling along. Uh, also underwater, of course. But these underwater sites are not underwater sites in the sense of being marine sites. It was terrestrial sites that are now underwater. And I think this is one of those pieces that we can understand that people long ago were able to live in a particular place on land, and now that land is no more on any level at all. As you think about our present state, 
we have to imagine that this may not be anymore either. It's not a pleasant thought, but I think it's an important one. Uh, one of the sites where this becomes quite visible is that it's not just a coastal phenomenon, but the site of Little Salt Spring. Today, the water level is here. In the Pale Indian, it was down there. What we've seen in uh, Little Salt Spring, as many of you probably know, is in Northport in southern Sarasota County. As the water levels rose on the coast, the water level also rose to the aquifer. And so what had been water level down here is now way up there. And so we have to be able to see and think about these changes, not just as coastal phenomena, but bubbling up nearly everywhere. And Little Salt Spring shows that quite well. Uh, many of you probably heard about it. You have to hear about this next year uh, when the time shift just talks. Uh, there's another terrestrial site off the coast of Minnesota Key. Uh, thanks to the Division of Historical Resources, there's been some very good excavations being done. The site was a terrestrial site from 7,200 years ago. Over 7,000 years ago, those archaic period people buried their dead in a peat pond. And so we have, under the current seas, an underwater burial site. And again, we just have to imagine the complexities that create that sort of dynamics that show they assumed their land would be there forever. They were quite wrong about it. And we're getting a bit of information, thanks to the Division of Historical Resources, about that way of life thousands of years ago. Those rising sea levels started stabilizing about 5,000 years ago. And one of the things that seems to have occurred, and this is really, uh, um, this I'm buying this from Ken Sassman and others, people mark that change. The previous rising sea levels was something noticed generation after generation. People actually, as far as we can tell, recognized that when they went to the coast, things had changed. But when it starts stabilizing, all across the southeast coast, uh, the National Park Service has found uh, these showrooms. These showrooms. There's still trends debates on it, but it seems what people did was actually have festivals on a regular basis right at the coast, probably to mark where the coast was <coughs> and to tell those stories of what had been and what was no longer happening. And those show rings. And he showed you from the historic Spanish point, the true cottage one is at historic Spanish point. It has been for thousands of years on land, and now the seas is starting to lap at it. And a storm surge uh, is in danger of being inundated. Uh, across the Everglades, Marco Chardon, who I mentioned earlier, or Mike Russo, have been noticing these tree islands and doing the excavations. Uh, Part of the ways that people dealt with the rising sea levels was create islands. By putting down dirt and materials, we're able to create uh, dry spaces. In the Everglades, uh, after the Spanish came, of course, there was a depopulation of the areas. Trees grew in those same spots, and they're quite visible to the archaeologists now. You can see some of the excavation units of a way of life that actually was able to deal with these changes that were ongoing through that period. We start asking, and this is from Windover, uh, why during the archaic, off Man what's now off Minnesota Key, and Windover, Mormono Spring, Little Salt Springs, other sites, did people bury their dead underwater? It's just speculation, but this is what this talk is about, right? To kind of start exploring some of the dynamics that uh, to understand how people in the past dealt with rising sea levels. And it seems worth pursuing. Then maybe this actually tells us something of how they dealt with the rising sea levels, how they dealt with the waters being a danger, a threat, or an active part of their lives that they were for their deceased, their loved ones, in the water. That ends after the archaic. That's after things stabilize. After this, the sea levels are no longer rising, 
uh, that phenomenon ends in Florida, and we start having mounds being built. And so the dead are no longer put underwater in ponds, they're put in mounds, in ceremonies, with materials. One of the parts that is always useful to think about, though, is the only way to make mounds is by digging out dirt. And then we also need to think about what kind of actions they were taking in their barrel pits that might have been related to those mounds. For too long, archaeologists just looked at the mounds and didn't look at the empty spaces. It seems like connecting those two also might be able to tell us something of how people were embracing the changes that they were living through. Uh, here's just a large scale mound on the St. John's River, just to give a sense of some good studies about the ceremonies that occur on a regular basis around those big mounds. And I do want, uh, this came about uh, in the newspapers right after Hurricane Irma. And I think it is a good piece of wisdom to borrow from the descendants uh, of those who were able to adapt to Florida during that period of rising sea levels, that period of stability, and the constant challenges that are there. Betty Osceola, my ancestors, the Seminole Mikasuki, were taught not to fear the hurricane. Generations of our people today need to remember to share the stories with our younger generations so they too will respect and love the natural world. Right? The sense that nature isn't theirs, our adversary, but that we have to be respectful and that we can, because we don't have a choice, live with the changes that are ongoing around us. That was the big sort of overview. I want to, this is Barry again from Ken Sassman, one of his projects to give a sense of uh, a really useful long-term project on the Lower Swanee, done with the University of Florida, the U.S. Cape Wildlife Service, to document your responses to sea level rise and when it rose a meter or two in height. It's a period of between 4600 and 7700 BP, uh, 2600 BCE to 1300 CE. And what the UF has, uh, project has done is to recognize that, so this is one of the terms that has been kicked in, terraforming, construction of living spaces, that to think about the actions of those native peoples in this coastal area is very much about making the land work for them. Cemeteries, if we start with the late archaic cemeteries as examples of terraforming, we see major civic centers developing, we see large circular uh, compounds developing, and this may well be part of the answer to what and how people deal with what's changing. Uh, the work has shown and is actually really brilliant in how it shows it, that there are changes in subsistence and people's way of life. But similar to uh, McGovern's work in Greenland, it's not just a response to the environment, but actually a response to different political and ritual changes that change what people eat, how they ate, how they organize their lives, that dealing with the changing climate meant changing who they were as people, and some of the evidence is uh, strong for making that point. It also shows, and here you see some of the maps, to deal with it, and we're not surprised in our world with connections, but exchange networks to, to see the objects that are moved around for the UF project, soapstones are particularly important for understanding those dynamics, and that they had exchange networks that connected their way of life, their threats to the inland people, the inland people knew what was going on there, and those networks seem to have been the safety social net that allowed people's ways of life to be reproduced through the generations. That UF project, you know I'm going through a lot of material quickly, uh, lays out the fluctuating coastal settlements, abandonment and relocation. It shows a shift to large civic ceremonial centers and it shows that at one point centers do get abandoned as people centralize in particular areas. The Lower Swanee Archaeological Survey, this gets right back to that beginning, it fits this larger framework. One is just to preserve information from threatened sites. As the uh, sea levels are rising, the Lower Swanee is flooding over, and so this project is recording, <coughs> documenting what archaeological sites are there. 
It constructs a history of the human responses. So we see what the ancient people have done. And lastly, and this has actually been an interesting challenge, to try to inform modern public policy, to get a seat at the table. And you're only here because you care about archaeology. It's surprisingly hard to get a seat at the table as there are discussions on rising sea levels. Archaeologists, have you made a poster at this point to try to advocate that we should be paying attention to? And I kind of like this one, right? Ask us about climate adaptation. We have thousands of years of experience. <laughs> so much of the work that's being done right now on rising sea levels really does focus on the presence and a sense that what we have today is threatened. And so let's see what's going on in terms of possibilities. The archaeological perspective, right? Archaeology, not just as discovery, not just as uh, the humanistic appreciation of the achievements of Asian people, which of course is at the heart of the discipline, but also seeing what people have done to take what we have today and give it a great deal of historicity to give us a great deal of time depth, and as some of those examples showed, some sense of what people have done in the past in terms of what worked, what didn't work, what made sense, and what didn't. Archaeologists are trying to publish more and more of this, but it does seem like there's different uh, perspectives. And so this is my chance to just show some books, uh, maybe to encourage you to read them if you haven't already. One approach, and Brian Fagan is a, a prolific author in archaeology, uh, the title really gives his sense of it, The Attacking Sea. Uh, it's, the book, of course, is more nuanced, but the point being that human endeavors have been flooded in the past. And one way of looking at the information from the archaeological record is the gloom and doom approach to lay out that humans really have messed up before and that we're more than capable <laughs> are really messing everything up. Uh, uh, right, this is an article uh, at the uh, New York Magazine. I just like the images, I like the titles. Uh, the Uninhabitable Earth, Famine, Economic Collapse, uh, Sunday Cooks Us, What Climate Change Could Wreck Sooner Than You Think. Right, that's back to the gloom and doom, the warnings. Uh, uh, I guess probably appropriate to, to have as part of the, the discussion. But I think the more productive avenue, and this comes out of a book that was published several years ago, and I want to kind of highlight it, that looked around the world and tried to see the places that had the greatest challenges with uh, climate change and what we could learn academically uh, about human res uh, resilience. And when I first picked up the book, I was actually a bit surprised uh, I said this before, but I think I want to really underline it, underline it now, underscore it. The four case studies that he laid out, one was the North Sea, another is the area around the Bay of uh, Bengal, in, in uh, Bangladesh, uh, the marshlands of Iraq, where the Tigris Euphrates uh, go in to the Persian Gulf, and the west coast of Florida. Right? It's so easy to imagine that while well, we like living here, and we appreciate living here, that's what it is, a nice place to live. In fact, the scholarly consensus, the global scholarly consensus, this is one of the top places in the world to think about climate change. This is actually where we're living now. It's something that just isn't just affecting us, that we should care about because we're here. We should care about it because it actually can tell people around the world what's going on. Uh, what, uh, Van de Root lays out is this notion of strengthening resilience for communities. To study the interactions of climate change, uh, sea level rise, and coastal development on a large scale. So one of the things archaeologists can do, and I feel so comfortable doing it even this presentation, we can talk about the short term, talk about the long term, and there's no problem at all talking about tens of thousands of years, even hundreds of thousands of years is at the base of the training, just work on those different scales. And when it's done with skill, the scale works really well. And I think it is one of the important uh, dynamic contributions of archaeology. 
a second to look at the cooperation and collaboration that occur for our local communities. The reason why assessments work in the Lower Suwannee, looking at those soapstones going all across the eastern uh, part of uh, North America is important, is because it gives us an archaeological hint of those exchange networks, maybe a sense of how they worked, what people did, and to think about our networks, what we have that's encouraged by our local governments, our state government, our national government, what we uh, encourage by our non-government organizations, by our social clubs, that can help us to read, oh my goodness, you can't read that at all. Can you actually read that for me, Sherry? Because now I'm um, Yeah, maybe, hold on. I want to make sure I get it right. Can you see a little clear on that? Uh, no, it starts with reform. Okay. <laughs> so, what, no, what, I can't read it. Sorry, what it, so uh, the paraphrasing, and, uh, to, and oversimplify, uh, to reformulate the relationship between land and sea. To really think about how we're related to the sea as the sea gets closer and closer, as the sea becomes part of our lives in a much more active way, what do we do about it? And then fourth, and this is a, a policy recommendation that is much more strong than the others, uh, to in fact recognize, to encourage people to recognize the seas are positive parts of our society, of our life. Uh, for Van der Report, do we focus on the eco economic aspects of the fisheries, the leisure that's there, so that uh, business leaders, political leaders, will care more about it and to show that, again, through time. I am ultimately optimistic. I think this is a tremendous challenge in terms of uh, preserving archaeological sites, heritage sites, it's a crisis, no question. We cannot protect all the sites that are going to be inundated in this region, let alone globally. When you saw that picture of uh, Fort Jefferson, I don't have any idea what one could do to protect that isolated site. For Egmont Key, that burial place, uh, what Seminoles sometimes refer to as a concentration camp, I'm not sure either work can be done. There are some challenges that may be behind us in terms of preserving particular sites. Some of the work that can be done, of course, is to excavate, document, record as much as we can. Uh, the heritage scouts, the, the work that, that's done in Scotland, is all about empowering citizens, the masses, to help on that so it's not just the work of professionals. But there's lots of ways that people have been successful in living on the wall. This goes to Cortez. It's not how people live, but I think it's a great image to show how one can be on the water. As I think about these issues, I am aware, because I'm a citizen and I vote and I pay attention to political discourse, that there's a contest over what to do over uh, climate change, over rising sea levels. I am aware as a politically involved member of this uh, community that there are some who frankly don't care. There are some who uh, argue it's not worth the effort. And there are others who put a great deal of effort trying to find solutions, adaptations, uh, possibilities that make it possible to have sustained communities on this coast, that the community here will have resilience. And as someone trained in archaeology, I want the archaeology to support those views. Not uh, in terms of being on a political fight, but to provide the evidence, to provide the uh, archaeological proof that some strategies have worked for people in the past, that if it worked for people in the past, it should be able to work for us. And so I thought, and I did this fairly quickly, but again, this is my chance to try out some ideas with a hopefully friendly audience of some of the insights that come from that long history of archaeology uh, that fits with some contemporary ideas. And I love starting with a simple one. Uh, one of the things that the ancient people did was, uh, we know this best with the Calusa, well, was build a lot of uh, canals. And those canals are usually discussed in terms of transportation channels, but those canals are also a way of dealing with the waters. Uh, I live near Philippi Creek. When I first moved to my house 10 years ago, after I bought the house, one of the neighbors said, do you have a kayak? Which <laughs> <laughs> I didn't. Because he said the neighborhood always flooded. I wasn't happy with my realtor. 
But actually, surprisingly, those 10 years, neighborhood has never flooded. It has never flooded because 25 years ago or so, the county built a series of reservoirs in what's now known as, this, what's known as the Celery Fields, still known as the Celery Fields, I think it was ever had a different name. And that system of reservoirs and moving the water away has worked. That this is actually a really good solution. I live near Philippi Creek. We've had a lot of rains. We had a hurricane. And my neighborhood hasn't flooded at all. In fact, the creek hasn't flooded since the celery field has done. Uh, we don't necessarily need archaeologists to tell people about it, but this is one of those cases with an archaeological record in Mesopotamia, in uh, Indus Valley, in, among the Calusa, show that this works. And we should encourage more of this to be done, because it seems to actually control the water so that people's homes are safe. And I'm happy that my home hasn't flooded, although I still get flood insurance. <laughs> From Sassman's uh, work, that sense of civic centers is where information exchange occurred. Right? We look at those archaic, late archaic uh, shell rings that we know that people gather together on a regular basis to eat, to drink, to meet mates, and to exchange information. That in the ancient days, people had to come together. And we know, and this is just one of those simple anthropological insights, people can make, communicate information through stories. Right? I'm giving you an academic lecture. Hopefully you remember some of it. But what really stays with people are stories. Stories about places, stories about how the things around them and the landscape has influenced them. And we think about what may have occurred, those stories told by the ancient people. We know some of them thanks to the Seminoles, but there are so many others. But we think about how information is exchanged today. And I think, again, one of the insights isn't unique from archaeology, but archaeology can help propel, is we need more climate stories. We actually have to be able to tell the stories of how people built resilience through the challenges. We need those stories to be shared, to be told in interesting ways, and that the lessons be obvious, so that people know what to do when inevitably uh, a large storm comes and a surge attacks or other such events. The third one, the uh, environmentalists uh, are clear on this, but again, it's not just about the environment today. The mangroves, the ancient peoples of this coast lived among mangroves. Uh, we know of how they were able to be around and how they used it, how helpful they are to take in the carbon, how they help sustain healthy fisheries, and how they protect community from storm damage, from storm surge. It turns out, if there's a mangrove, the waves just don't pass all the way through it. You've all seen the mangroves. It's obvious why, with those big roots everywhere, it just knocks the power out of those storms. There was a case in Manny County. Ultimately, it lost. And this is why I think the archaeology has to be there. If there's other tools where you have to add the tools. A large strand of mangroves on the coast that had archaeological sites around it is being developed. The mangroves are going to be removed, and apartment uh, housing is going up. And it's almost inevitable that if a storm surge hits, a hurricane gets into the bay, all those buildings are going to be hit hard and those people's lives are uh, going to be hurt, at least in the short run, if not the long run. We could argue for mangroves because they're important to have trees. We can also argue the ancient people knew what they were doing, and that we should take some of those lessons and just keep on repeating them, just so hopefully we can actually regrow some of those mangroves and protect our coasts. I see in many ways, uh, I like this image, I'm not, uh, this is close to the very end of the presentation, uh, the canary in the coal mine image. Archaeologists have been noticing sea level rise and climate change uh, for generations. It's one of the reasons that in the 1960s, uh, interest in the environment, environmental archaeology, grew so quickly. You walk around the coast, you see it. You excavate and you see the evidence. You study the histories for peoples all around the world. It's there. 
And so in a lot of ways, archaeologists have been and need to continue to be at the forefront as we see the seas arising, as we need that perseverance to meet the challenges and to create a way of life that allows us to enjoy the coastline without fear. And we need to develop those, story, those climate stories for communicating the history and the heritage for this region, but of course elsewhere as well.